Hey everybody, Johnny the Queer Potus here, and today we're going to talk about a big Supreme Court case in the news this past week. Catholic Archdiocese of Brooklyn v. Governor Andrew Cuomo. In a 5-4 decision, the court ruled to exempt churches, synagogues, and mosques in the state of New York from Governor Cuomo's recent COVID restrictions. The case involves issues of religious freedom, the First Amendment, and public safety. But it's particularly notable because it's the first case in which Justice Amy Coney Barrett cast a decisive vote. In this video, I'll explore some of the mechanics of the case, dive into some Supreme Court history, and will even deliver my own ruling, as will my fellow co-host from the President's Suck livestream, Connor. <laughs> and that reminds me, please like this video, subscribe to this channel, and don't miss Connor and me on President's Suck, broadcast live both here and on Twitch. Links below. We just did one on JFK, and you can check that one out right after you watch this. Okay, let's jump into the case. In recent weeks, COVID-19 cases have spiked across the globe. Many attribute the spike to an increase in social gatherings around the holidays, as well as a lack of state enforcement of social distancing, mask wearing, and other preventative measures to stop the spread. This feeling has brought extra scrutiny on America's churches, which have striven to continue services during the pandemic. In the state of New York, Governor Andrew Cuomo recently debuted a strategy for fighting COVID. Cuomo's plan divides the state into color-coded zones based on the number of cases. When an area suffers a spike, it's classified as a red zone, and red zones are subject to the sternest restrictions. In red zones, houses of worship are limited to 10 people at a time. These limits have provoked a backlash from religious advocacy groups who challenge the order in court. In early cases at the lower courts, the churches were not granted the relief they sought. There was a ruling from May, South Bay v. Newsom, in which the Supreme Court had sided with the state against the church, and this had set a precedent regarding rulings on COVID policy. That case was 5-4 to four as well, in the other direction. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was still on the court. Now a new justice sits in her place, Amy Coney Barrett. Brooklyn v. Cuomo had the chance to overturn the precedent set by South Bay v. Newsom. Although the lower court cases found in favor of Cuomo, they did acknowledge that the governor's order had been unduly harsh on the church. The governor's public statements accompanying the order further suggested Cuomo was targeting the faithful. Religious institutions have been a problem. If you do not agree to enforce the rules, then we'll close the institutions down. Make no mistake, Cuomo was not trying to sneak a church ban past the radar. He was explicit about it. Orthodox Jewish gatherings often are very, very large. Uh, some religious leaders believe they have herd immunity, uh, which is not true. <clears throat> some uh, people have followed politics and think that masks are ineffective and this is all a hoax. That's not true. Cuomo's statements reflect a growing sentiment among some Americans that churches are not doing all they can to fight the pandemic, or are even being purposefully negligent. Stories like a 7,000-person Orthodox Jewish wedding held in Williamsburg, New York, have provoked outrage in the press. And from Cuomo's point of view, such undermining of COVID restrictions is making it hard to enforce pandemic guidelines overall. Enforcement. Oh, that's so harsh, enforcement. Yeah, it's not. Enforcement is kind. You know why? Because enforcement saves lives. This feeling provided the rationale for singling out houses of worship in Cuomo's executive order. Unsurprisingly, this provoked a strong reaction from certain religious communities. Jewish advocates in Rockland County accused the governor of redlining pandemic zones specifically to include Orthodox synagogues. The stories about redlining, the stories about drawing a map around a community based on who they are, what they do, and based on fear, as the governor himself admitted, as we explained in the lawsuit. Public worship is not a non-essential activity. It is an activity protected by the United States Constitution. Here is a map of Rockland County. Within these 12 square miles, no synagogue was allowed more than 10 people at a time. 
Whether you take Cuomo's side or not, one can at least sympathize with how a community of Orthodox Jews might feel about being sequestered in a red zone, all their activities being characterized as spreading a virus. Both the Catholic Archdiocese of Brooklyn and the Jewish advocacy organization called Agadath Israel of America brought suits to New York's Second Court of Appeals to stop Cuomo's order. The Court of Appeals denied the request, setting a second hearing for December 18th. Thus, with so many Sabbaths and Sundays between now and then, the Archdiocese brought its case to the Supreme Court to ask for what is called an injunction. And basically, that's a fancy way of saying exemption. It's important to know that an injunction is generally granted only under extraordinary circumstances, which, as you'll see, is a fairly subjective term. The foundational claim of this case was that Cuomo's order violated the First Amendment of the Constitution. So perhaps it's worth taking a few moments to dive into the history of the First Amendment and its relationship to the court. When the United States first broke away from England in 1783, after seven years of brutal warfare, there was much cause for celebration. But Americans would soon find that piecing together an actual functioning nation wouldn't be so easy. With so many different people having so many different interests, everyone was worried about too much power being centralized in a single governing body. This made writing a constitution everyone would be willing to sign extremely complicated. Much of the new nation's population had fled religious persecution in their own home countries and worried how a strong central government might end up dominated by one or another rival sect. In order to garner support for the constitution, the framers included a Bill of Rights, 10 things the central government could not do to its citizens no matter what. These 10 amendments reflected a compromise between having a strong, active central government while also giving its citizens maximum personal freedom. The First Amendment, with which this case is concerned, singles religion out for extraordinary protections. Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion or abridging the right of the people to peaceably assemble. This amendment is often considered a cornerstone of American democracy. Yet, idolized as it is, the First Amendment leaves a lot of questions unanswered. Questions real life has a tendency of raising in unexpected ways. What if a particular religious practice breaks the law? What if a religious practice is harmful to the public at large? The contradictions are many. Can Mormons be banned from practicing polygamy? Can a Jewish merchant be exempted from a city ordinance that closes businesses on Sundays? Can the Church of Santeria be banned from performing animal sacrifices? Can an Amish family keep its children out of public schools? These are just a few examples of real cases which have come before the Supreme Court and challenged how the First Amendment is interpreted. In that last case I mentioned, Wisconsin v. Yoder, the court ruled to exempt Amish children from attending public school after the age of 14. This particular case established a precedent. According to Yoder, religious institutions were exempted from any laws that forced an undue burden on them. Now, this did not mean the church could ignore any law it wanted. A religious institution is not exempt from any law that serves a compelling public interest. A church can't just engage in human sacrifice because it's in the public interest to not have churches murdering people. By contrast, a 15-year-old Amish boy spending his weekends farming and raising barns instead of shooting spitballs at his chemistry teacher does not constitute a compelling public interest. At least, that's what the court found in Yoder. In the case with which this video is concerned, there is clearly a compelling public interest, stopping the spread of COVID-19. So, this case will fail if Governor Cuomo can demonstrate that there is a compelling public interest in shutting down church services to stop the spread of COVID-19. In order to win, the applicants will have to show that church services have no impact in fighting the pandemic. But that's just part of the battle. To get an injunction from state law, a party must demonstrate that it will suffer irreparable harm without it. In other words, they must show that Cuomo's order will cause long-term damage to New York's religious community. Let's take a look at how they made their case for irreparable harm. The Archdiocese argued first and foremost that the order does irreparable harm to the First Amendment rights of religious Americans. 
The loss of First Amendment freedoms for even minimal periods of time unquestionably constitutes irreparable injury. L. Rod v. Burns. Perhaps more compellingly, though, they argued irreparable spiritual harm. Ten people per church is no kind of church service at all. In some Orthodox faiths, a synagogue needs ten men to form a quorum before others can be admitted. This amounted to an effective ban on women attending synagogue. Withholding the spiritual fulfillment and community provided by in-person fellowship in itself, the archdiocese argued, constituted an irreparable harm. And what about proving that church services wouldn't harm the public interest, i.e. wouldn't cause a spread of the virus? Well, it's difficult to prove that church attendance per se has a disproportionate impact on infection rates, especially while we're dead center in the middle of the story. But the archdiocese insisted that it had zero reported cases resulting from church services and assured the court it had followed COVID restrictions up to this point to the letter. Quote, in the lead up to these 25% capacity reopenings, diocesan leadership assisted parishes in obtaining all essential items they would need to safely reopen, including masks, disinfectants, and hand sanitizer. Prior to reopening, each church was thoroughly sanitized. All parishes were advised to report instances of COVID-19, if any, directly to their pastors, who would immediately inform the bishop. A list of 10 different measures was provided, including enforced social distancing, mask mandates, and other measures in compliance with state guidelines. Now you can say, but churches are causing the spread. Every time I turn on the news, it's another synagogue or another evangelical church flaunting COVID regulations. No one's social distancing, no masks. These people all think it's a hoax anyway. Well, the First Amendment protects your right to believe that and say that, but it does not give you the right to legislate on that feeling. At least legally speaking, you are flirting with anti-religious discrimination. But proving anti-discrimination in court can be difficult. It requires something called strict scrutiny. To pass the strict scrutiny test, a law, or in this case an executive order, must be proven to further a compelling governmental interest. Remember that phrase? In this case, the compelling governmental interest is stopping the spread of COVID. But to pass strict scrutiny, there is another requirement. The law must also be tailored specifically to achieving its stated goal. In other words, you can't pass a law ordering all redheads to join the army by claiming it serves the compelling governmental interest of having more soldiers. The question is asked, why specifically redheads? In order to pass strict scrutiny, you'd have to prove that conscripting redheads is narrowly tailored toward achieving some goal in the public. Say, we're going to invade some country that's full of redheads, and we need soldiers that can blend in with the population. An absurd example, but one I hope demonstrates how strict scrutiny works. Similarly, Cuomo will have to prove that closing houses of worship is part of a narrowly tailored strategy to fight COVID-19. Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn v. Andrew Cuomo was set for a hearing on November 25th, 2020. But, days earlier, Governor Cuomo added a new dynamic to the case. He actually rescinded his executive order, which raised the question, should the court even bother ruling on this at all? Well, the governor could reinstate the restrictions later. Filing for another injunction could take weeks. Why not nip it in the bud now and send a message to the governor that these kinds of shenanigans won't stand. So before we look at how the court ruled on this case, here is a short list of important questions that, in my view, should be considered when reviewing the story. One, is it in the public interest to have tougher restrictions on churches during a pandemic? Two, do Cuomo's restrictions unduly burden religious institutions in a way that violates the right to free exercise of religion? Three, Was the governor's order restricting houses of worship to 10 people tailored to fight the pandemic? And four, should the court rule on this at all, considering Cuomo rescinded the order days earlier? So with those questions in mind, how did the court find? By a 5-4 to vote, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Archdiocese. This meant that Cuomo's executive order could not be enforced on any house of worship in the state of New York. 
Justices Gorsuch, Thomas, Alito, Kavanaugh, and Barrett voted yes. Roberts, Kagan, Sotomayor, and Breyer voted no. For perspective, that's three Trump judges and a Bush senior judge on one side, and two Obama judges and a Clinton judge on the other side. The two justices appointed by George W. Bush were split. Most of the press coverage around this case focused on Amy Coney Barrett. This was the first time she broke a tie on the court, and the fact that the case involved religion played into established fears about Barrett's own religious convictions. Her faith was the subject of some of the most contentious moments of her confirmation hearing. Can you set aside whatever Catholic beliefs you have regarding any issue before you? And while she insisted she brought no religious agenda to the court. I don't have any agenda. I have no agenda to try to overrule Casey. Um, I have an agenda to stick to the rule of law and decide cases as they come. Democratic senators nonetheless found her explanations unconvincing. And I think in, in your case, the dogma lives loudly within you. This case will certainly further that view of Justice Barrett in the public mind. Unfortunately, she did not write an opinion on the case, so we don't know what her actual thinking was. Still, the focus on Barrett tends to obscure who the real star of this case actually was, and that person was Justice Neil Gorsuch. Gorsuch has only been on the court for a few years, but he now finds himself at the head of the largest block on the Supreme Court, the Trump wing. Gorsuch's opinion on this case will inform how courts decide future cases involving pandemic restrictions, and it reads like a manifesto. Government is not free to disregard the First Amendment in times of crisis. Yet recently, during the pandemic, certain states have ignored these long-settled principles. Today's case supplies just the latest example. Gorsuch's dissent boiled down to a few basic points. One, houses of worship were unfairly targeted in a way that did not have an impact on the pandemic and does do irreparable harm to them. By executive decree, houses of worship in red zones are all but closed, limited to a maximum of 10 people. In the Orthodox Jewish community, that limit might operate to exclude all women, considering 10 men are necessary to establish a minion or a quorum. Interestingly, I recently read an article from JTA, which offers a rebuttal to this point. Apparently, the 10 men forming a quorum is a pretty contentious issue, even within Orthodox communities. For a judge who's trying to keep the government out of religion, Justice Gorsuch managed to weigh in on an issue of some controversy within the religion itself. I left a link to that article in the description below. Two. The governor targeted religious institutions over secular ones. The businesses the governor considers essential include hardware stores, acupuncturists, and liquor stores. Bicycle repair shops are essential too. Now who knew public health would so perfectly align with secular convenience? Three, state governors need to ease off those First Amendment violations. Remember that Cuomo's order had been rescinded days earlier, and Gorsuch could have chosen not to grant the injunction on that basis. This he called, quote, sheltering in place when the Constitution is under attack. Gorsuch wanted to send a message both to the governors and the lower courts. At the flick of a pen, they have asserted the right to privilege restaurants, marijuana dispensaries, and casinos over churches, mosques, and temples. In far too many places, for far too long, our first freedom has fallen on deaf ears. Four. Finally, South Bay v. Newsom, the case RBG voted on before she died, came up when the pandemic was only three months old. Now the pandemic has been with us for almost a year. You can't have emergency powers forever. Even if the Constitution has taken a holiday during this pandemic, it cannot become a sabbatical. Writing the dissent, Chief Justice Roberts took issue with Gorsuch's heavy-handed characterization of the court's attitude toward First Amendment rights. To be clear, I do not regard my dissenting colleagues as cutting the Constitution loose during a pandemic, yielding to a particular judicial impulse to stay out of the way in times of crisis, or sheltering in place when the Constitution is under attack. Beyond this inner court drama, Roberts pointed out that he didn't see why the court should take the extraordinary step of granting an injunction when the governor had already rescinded the order. Of course, Gorsuch's answer was, so he couldn't do it again. Roberts argued, let him try and we'll hear the case again. But Gorsuch argued that could take weeks to arrange. 
Why not grant the injunction now? Roberts and other dissenters thought the court was going out of its way to dictate COVID policy, which ought to be left to the scientists. As you can see, this case is a complicated one that can't be boiled down to a catchy headline. There are obviously endless roads we could go down in discussing this case and its implications. But I thought it might be fun instead to have myself and my co-host from President Suck, Connor, each give our own rulings on the case. And if you're bored enough to write out a several paragraph long YouTube comment, feel free to write your own opinion down below. All right, court is in session. The Honorable Judge Connor presiding. So I will vote to grant the injunction. It's, it's not hard to see why certain communities have been targeted. You know, religious spaces have close quarters. They have pews, prayers, singing, holy water, communion. There are money collectors, altar service. The list goes on and on. However, the religious institutions would not have done their own safety and security measures without the initial measures done by the state. It was clear at the beginning of this crisis, and it is clear now that these are measures that need to have taken place. There are reports of mass weddings, mass services in all different boroughs in New York City coming from this past weekend alone during the worst portion of the pandemic. You know, these institutions need to be restricted. There are no two ways about it. But to restrict them as much as only allowing 10 persons during a religious gathering is way over the top and unnecessary. So my suggestion would be to keep enforcing the original restrictions because the real problem that Cuomo seems to have is that a lot of these COVID restrictions aren't being followed in the religious communities. And, you know, if, if that's the case, there needs to be more enforcement and, and more consequences to not following these restrictions. You can complain all you want about your infringements on the right to pray, but you can't pray when you're dead. So in conclusion, eh, too much, Cuomo, too much. And now the Honorable Judge Potus presiding. I rule to grant the injunction. I agree with the lower courts that the applicants have proved both irreparable harm and that they are following COVID guidelines as well as any other institution in the public sphere. Although the restrictions in question were pulled back days before this case was heard, there's no reason to keep the applicants in a constant state of fear and anxiety, knowing that at any moment the restrictions may be reimposed, and they'll have to come back here and ask for an injunction again. Besides, the governor's rhetoric surrounding the order was extremely concerning and genuinely a bit shocking to listen to. It's worth taking the moment to remind our nation's executives that they are bound to respect the First Amendment rights of their citizens. For these reasons, I concur with the majority. However, rather than suggest, as my fellow concurrent Justice Gorsuch would, that the grave emergency we are currently facing is an attack on our First Amendment rights, I grant the injunction with a different warning. The grave emergency is COVID-19, and it hasn't passed. In fact, we're entering a particularly fraught period as we speak. South Bay v. Newsom should not be considered overturned. The battle against the pandemic should be regarded as of the highest public interest by lower courts, and only when a governor botches it up this badly, as Cuomo did, should this ruling be used as a guidance by the lower courts. And so, by a two to zero majority, this court has decided to grant the injunction. Happy worshiping! Thanks everyone for taking the time to listen to this video today. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel and tell all your friends and family about Queer POTUS. We're almost at a thousand subscribers at this point and I could really use your help to get over that huge milestone. Thanks to everyone who's so far supported the channel. And if you'd like to become a patron, please go to www.patreon.com slash QueerPotus and begin donating today. Thanks, everyone, and I hope you have a great holiday.